And welcome to Care Partner Q&A Mondays at the Inspired Memory Care Training, Education, and Resource Center at the 80th Street Residence. Hi, I'm Nettie Harper, and I'm here with Kelly Gilligan. And we're coming to you live from the Upper East Side of Manhattan. We meet here at the 80th Street Residence with our team of professional and family care partners and with the folks who live here for focus groups, pilot testing, and feedback. It's our pleasure to present Care Partner Q&A Mondays as an initiative of the Training, Education, and Resource Center. Please, if you have a topic you're interested in discussing, feel free to type it into the comments section or email us at info at inspiredmemorycare.com. Thank you for joining us for today's discussion of the documentary, The Rest I Make Up, by filmmaker Michelle Memren. Please join us in watching the trailer now, and then Michelle will be joining us for further discussion. Am I the subject of your film? Yes. Am I so fascinating that you feel I don't need script, I need rehearsal? I myself, I will be so interesting. <laughs> People say, who is that? Irene, as she prefers to be called, was born in Cuba, wrote over 40 plays, won nine OBs, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. No one ever knows who she is. She's the one who's been out there cutting the brush, paving the trails. Every play is different. Each play is demonstrating a different muscle. I have so much style that you don't even know. You think it's mistakes. Try not to think too much about what makes good writing, but just to let it come out. There's nobody who's had the influence in American playwriting as a teacher. I often think of it as the experience of Alice when she goes through the whole The neighborhood of artists. Yeah, the real deal. <laughs> Everybody always fell in love with her. I always called her Doña Juana. To me, writing plays is not a way of earning a living, but it is a way of earning a life. Being an artist, you have to abandon any notion of things making sense. Does loss of memory imply that I don't remember anything or that there is a loss? The whole purpose of her classes was to teach them not to get stuck. I haven't been writing for how long? For years and years. <laughs> Irene, it's Michelle. Follow me, kid. Writing, Michelle calls talking to a camera writing. Is this part of your story? I don't hide anything. I am what I am. I am a playwright. It's my life. It's my work. You changed a lot of people's lives. Oh, yes? It changed my life. Does this movie go into the future, or is it only the past? These are memories like dreams. It's true. So we're here today with Michelle Memron, the filmmaker of The Rest I Make Up, which is the story of Maria Irene Fornes. Um, Michelle, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, we're so excited to have you here, and we're so excited for the screening that's that's coming up. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the film? What should our viewers know? Well, um, the film is, I would say that your viewers should know that the film is a, um, a collaboration that spanned over 15 years with myself, um, who was then at the time you know, 25 years old, uh, collaboration with the playwright Maria Irene Fornas, who was in her 70s and um, had stopped writing because she was having um, some cognitive decline and the beginnings of dementia. And she had stopped writing and we, um, we turned to the camera as a way to keep creating uh, because she couldn't physically write, but she was constantly performing and uh, these monologues and we were able to capture them on, on camera and then we just followed her memories um, throughout our relationship 
and, and so that's what the film became, a collection of all of these fragments um, that, that we hope seamlessly move from one moment into the next. Um, and uh, I guess that's that's what I'd like the you know, and it's it's a very joyful uh, journey that we take together um, through uh, many different locations and um, and through quite a bit of time. So. And Michelle, just to clarify, um, Maria Irene, she preferred to be called Irene. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah. Okay. So. Can you share a little bit, before your friendship with Irene, had you ever partnered with someone living with cognitive change? I had not, I had not. I had, a, a, my grandmother had Alzheimer's, um, but I was uh, very young when that happened. And I, um, and I, and then she was also um, Egyptian Israeli and she spoke when she um, went through uh, her own experience with dementia, she started, started speaking mostly in Hebrew and Arabic. And so um, I didn't, I don't speak either of those languages. So um, I wasn't able to really communicate with her and I didn't, I was too young to know. So that, that uh, so I didn't have that kind of relationship with her. Um, and in a lot of ways, um, you know, people would, would refer to, Irene, I mean, Irene and I became family over this process. So, um, so, so in a lot of ways I felt like if I could go back in time and have a relationship with my grandmother, I would, I would take what I learned from being with Irene. Yeah. But this was my first time. So, Michelle, how did you come to meet Irene? How did your paths cross? How did this, this friendship kind of have the opportunity to develop? Well, yeah, yeah that's a great question. So I, um, I was a journalism major in college. I went to college in Chicago. And I, um, my brother's an actor. I, I had a lot of friends who were playwrights. I love the theater, and um, and I secretly wanted to be a playwright. So I was in journalism school, but I secretly wanted to be a playwright. So I took a playwriting class, and I read one of her plays, and um, it was called *The Conduct of Life*. And I was completely blown away by it. It was unlike any kind of theater that I'd ever read, or seen, or anything. And um, and so I, I sought her out secretly and I read all of the plays that were, that were published at the time. And then um, I went on to, I, I realized quickly that I wasn't meant to be a playwright, but, um, but I could write about theater as a journalist. So that's what I did. I ended up writing profiles on playwrights and writing about productions. And, um, and I was doing a piece about um, playwrights retaliating against critics. And I was like, you know, I interviewed uh, Paula Vogel and, and Christopher Durang and, you know, Jules Pfeiffer and all these people. And, um, and Irene was on my list and I was like, she's my favorite playwright. I wonder if she's listed in the phone book. And she was. And so I called her up and she picked up the phone and um, I told her about what I was doing. And she said, sure, come over. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. I'm gonna go over to her house. What's happening? So she she met me on the corner of Waverly and Sixth, and um, we went to an Indian restaurant and drank lots of beers and talked about theater and became it was this instantaneous kinship. Um, and so whenever I was in the West Village where she lived, I would you know pop in and we'd go have coffee or we'd go to you know thrift stores or we you know walk down the street and just talk and talk and talk. And that's, that's where it started. Um, that's the, where the friendship started. That was around uh, 1999. Wow. She sounds magnetic. Oh my God, completely. Um, and I'm a very, I mean, I wouldn't say, it. yes, I would say it. I'm an anxious person. But so, you know, being with Irene was like, she was so focused and so in the moment and um, spending time with her was like, it made me see parts of New York City that I'd never seen before in a way that I'd never even thought about. And it also was like taking a Xanax. I mean, it was like basically like you were so in the moment that I, I couldn't think about the past or the future or my own neuroses. I was like, oh my God, Irene, look at that building. You're right. What's, it, what's on the top of that building? Or like, what is that, that red scarf that someone is wearing that I wouldn't have noticed? You know, like she was constantly pulling it back to the present tense. And I don't think, I, I think that um, she was always like that. And I think then having, you know, short-term memory loss even um, intensified that being in the moment with her. Do you feel that that, that kind of skill that she had 
predating her diagnosis might have influenced her her plays and been part of what drew, drew you in just out of curiosity? Oh my God, totally. I mean, she is able to inhabit a moment like no other. I mean, she created these worlds on stage that were so of their own, um, they were impenetrable and um, they, they pulled you into this world. So when you're being, spending time with Irene, she pulls you into her world, whatever she's experiencing, she wants you to come along for the ride. And, you know, and that also makes it a lot about Irene, you know, so, so you also have to be, um, you have to be ready to, to and, and as a journalist, I love asking questions and I love um, learning about people. So that's a natural for me. So spending time with my favorite playwright, asking her questions and being a part of her world was, was a delight. For some other people, they might be like, oh my God, like it's all about Irene. But for me, I was like, that's heaven, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Michelle, besides sharing great Indian food, drinking beers and sharing coffee, what would you say are the best parts of your friendship that you had with Irene or your partnership with her? Oh, I mean, I, I would go to Irene for advice all the time. And, um, and at the time I was like newly coming out of the closet too. So it was, um, my life was changing in a lot of ways. And, um, and Irene had had this whole, you know, past of being, you know, um, she wasn't necessarily the most out person on the planet, but she was like, um, not, not, you know, if you asked her about her life, she was like, oh, of course, I'll tell you about all my love affairs, all my things. And so I was really young and, um, and I would come to her, I was like, I just started doing internet dating and I would come to her and she was just like, why? why do you have to do this? Like, why, why do you have to like put yourself through this? And she would go through profiles with me and she would be like, no, 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 you're not writing that person. You're not writing that person. Oh, this one, this one you're writing to. And, um, and I would introduce her to, you know, like it was, it was, um, she was, she was also able to see something in me that I couldn't see in myself. So, um, the fact that, you know, uh, I was, I was a journalist, but I really wanted to be an artist. And she would be like, I know who you are. I may not remember your name right now, but I know who you are. You're an artist, you know, we're, we're alike, we're alike. And that, you know, those moments of just being, you know, I never felt so seen and heard in my life. So, you know, so it was, it, it was um, very reciprocal. And a lot of people will say, oh my God, you gave so much to this woman. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like she gave me, so, I mean, tenfold, you know, she was just there and, um, and, and eager to listen, you know, and, and very eager to talk. So, yeah. Sounds like an absolutely beautiful friendship. Yeah, it was. It was. So you, you touched on this already a little bit. You, you mentioned that she had this intense presence that she, it sounds like she's always had. And so I guess one of my questions is, do you feel that, that her experience of dementia impacted your friendship in any way? Did it make for a different experience? What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's hard for me to say because I think that I, by the time that I became friends with Irene, she had all, she was already experiencing cognitive decline. So, um, so, and, and, and memory and short-term memory loss. So I didn't know it at the time because I hadn't met her before. Um, this was my first experience, but, you know, over time, it was very clear to me that, you know, A, she had all this time for me and B, you know, she, she was, not, you know, not leaving her apartment and she wasn't working. This is a person who was in, incredibly industrious and, um, and worked all over the world and taught writing workshops and, uh, mentored tons of playwrights. So, um, so, I mean, I would say that, like, I didn't know any other Irene. I mean, I think that that was the beauty of it. It was that, um, that I, that, 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 that presence, I saw it in her plays though. And so, and I, and I read it in her interviews. So I think that that was, um, so I, I, I do think that that existed before. I think it became distilled to its essence in, with, with, the, with the dementia. Um, but for me, it, you know, people will say like, uh, you know, a lot of friends stayed away because they, you know, they, they couldn't handle 
the loss they, of like who they who they knew before. And for me, it was there was no sense of loss. There, it was all all like, oh my god, this is an incredible human being and an artist and um, you know someone that that I want to be around all the time. So, um, so I did, so, so it's hard for me to say because I didn't know, I have an experience like working with her in the nineties or, or the eighties or, you know, um, so it was all about like what remains and what, what is gained and not what is lost. Which I think is really, really, really powerful. Um, and it's evident, I think, to an extent in, in how you partnered on the project. Do you want to comment on that at all about kind of building with what, what was there and, and how you went about that a bit? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, so it basically happened by accident. I mean, I'm not, a, I didn't, wasn't a filmmaker at the time. I was, um, I mean, as I said, I was a writer and, um, and a fact checker and among other, many other like odd jobs that I was doing in my twenties. And um, so, you know, we picked up this uh, old high camera that my father had gotten me and we went to Brighton beach one day and um, Irene was the only one that who remembered to wear a bathing suit. We all forgot and Irene had remembered. I was like, oh my God. Um, and we were like building sand castles on the beach talking about uh, Cuba and the ephemeral nature of theater. And, you know, and then, you know, I turned the camera on her and it's in the film. And I say like, Irene, does the camera make you uncomfortable? And she's like, oh, my darling, the camera to me is my beloved, the one who wants me always. And I give everything I have to a camera. And so it, it clicked, you know, in my head that I was like, because she was so lamenting the loss of writing in her life. It was, she was, it was her life. And then all of a sudden it's gone and she doesn't know why, you know, she didn't want to go to a doctor. She didn't know why this was happening to her. So I called her agent and I said, this miraculous thing happened on the beach. You know, what if Irene and I worked, collaborated on a film project, you know, like, what would that look like? And she was like, go for it, do it, you know, whatever you want to do, go for it. So, you know, I got a better camera and I, you know, and we had lots of like trial and error with the camera, mistakes were made um, and they became part of the film, you know, I mean, it actually like that became, we became collaborators and that was a very important thing um, for me because I did not want to make it, the whole thing was a collaboration and we weren't thinking we we're even making a film at the beginning. We were just thinking we were working. I would call her up and she'd say, are we working today? And I would be like, yes, we're working today. And that sense, and it gave me such a sense of purpose too, because I was really lost in my life. I didn't know, you know, what I wanted to do or what was the right thing to do. And here was Irene who was also lost. So we were both at this crossroads and, um, and, and decided to collaborate. Um, and I didn't know that it would, you know, eventually 15 years later become this film, but you know, somewhere along the line, it crossed into actually we're making a film. Um, but, but it was really like, I would just show up to Sirens with a camera and we would see what happened that day. And it was, a, it was also a tool that we used in the collaboration so that when Irene said, oh, I don't remember that you came over yesterday. I would be like, oh, we went to Washington Square Park. Let me show you. And then the camera became, and I, you know, I say it in the film, the camera is your memory. And it was, I mean, it, it was, it was part of our collaboration. It was a third character in our collaboration. So, but I wanted it to be very clear. Like I, I did not want it to be um, just documenting somebody that was going through what she was going through. I wanted us to be working together on a project that actually was helping um, us both live through this moment. So Michelle, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I was wondering if you could expand um, even further. How do you feel that Irene responded to the change in medium from pen to film? Oh, I think, I think she loved it in a lot of ways. And, um, and I think she also missed writing in a lot of ways. Um, but I, but she did say once, um, you know, I, I love to be documented. I want to be in every film that ever is. And, um, and I think, you know, she had a lot of, we had so much fun doing this. Um, it was, I mean, that's why we continue to do it. If it wasn't fun, Irene wouldn't have done it. Um, I mean, that was, that was part of her work ethic. And, um, but I, I do think, you know, we did over the years also do writing exercises together. 
And those were, you know, those were um, different. We documented those as well, but those were different. They were, you know, they were challenging in the way that um, she felt like she had to be something that she couldn't be, no, she could no longer be. Mm -hmm. and, um, and with the filming, there was so much freedom involved. Like everything that came out of her mouth felt like it was um, prearranged and premeditated, but it was totally spontaneous. And, um, and so there was a great freedom and, you know, and, and a lot to play with in the edit room for us too, because it did felt, feel like she was continuing to write. So I do think she responded really well to the, the, the change in medium. And I, I don't know that she would necessarily think the two are separate, you know, because she also learned, um, she was dyslexic and she wasn't a big reader. So she learned by conversation and by, you know, some people would say that she learned by osmosis of like hanging out with all these artists and writers in the East Village in the 50s. And um, she, so conversation was always a part of, of how she um, interpreted the world, overheard conversations she would write down. So I think it was a very natural transition, just sitting around talking. I, you know, we, we've been honored to be able to view the film already, Kelly and I, and I think, you know, what I saw come through is kind of what you're saying here. It's like there were no expectations. She was able to be free on any moment and share and, <laughs> One thing I loved is her humor. So much humor. I found myself like, you know, a lot of people think, you know, it, it's dementia, so it's very sad and this is terrible. And I found myself laughing often at this film. I mean, her humor just came across and you could see the friendship that you both had. I mean, you're the both of you editing this, you really captured the essence of, I think, a beautiful friendship, I have to say. Well, thank you. You know, actually, Irene wasn't involved in the edit, unfortunately, but she did have, um, she did see cuts of the film over time. And, um, and yeah, I mean, that, that freedom to just, um, I mean, Irene was fearless, you know, and she, and, and so um, she had so much curiosity about the world and she had so much curiosity about what was happening to her so that you can actually like, be with her and not be afraid. And I think, um, I, I mean, I think somebody, like anybody who's gone through any kind of illness knows like how much um, fear plays a part in, in, in it. And Irene was, was having none of it. She was just like, you know, and, and partially because she was forgetting that she had it. So, I mean, in that way, it, it worked to her benefit because she could just be like, wait, I'm forgetting? Well, okay, well, I've always been forgetful, but like, what's happening to me? Um, so, I mean, I think that curiosity is really refreshing. And it's also like, don't take yourself so seriously. I mean, you know, I mean, her, her response was like, well, we're all gonna die. So we might as well have fun, you know, like live this day, you know? So, I mean, I, I, that was really refreshing to me because, you know, as somebody who perseverates over things, it was just like, let it go, you know, like, <laughs> just be, be in the day. So that was great. Yeah, that, that seems, um, she had like a very unique optimism about her, a very unique presence about her. So that definitely came through. Um, I wanted to actually ask similar to you, Nettie, I was wondering if she, if Irene was involved in the editing process, but it, now that you've answered that in terms of the creative process itself, she clearly was the subject on the camera and you've mentioned that she's seen a cut she had seen a couple of the cuts of the film were there other parts of the creative process where she had involvement and also in doing this project that obviously created so much structure and meaning it sounds like for both of you at, at a tenuous time in life did you see the successes in the creative process transfer into other parts of Irene's life or other parts of your life? Did you see the benefits of, of the project kind of affecting you on a more holistic scale? Well, yeah, let's, yeah, um, those are two fantastic questions. Um, let's, let's take the first one. So um, in terms of the, uh, the creative process, I mean, it was really, uh, you know, Irene had seen, um, things that we use, like, as I mentioned, we use the camera as a tool to show her, um, you know, different uh, scenes. And I don't want to spoil anything for people who haven't seen the film about where we go and what we do. But, um, 
But, you know, it, she, I remember sitting in Miami and going through um, New York footage with her and, and her laughing and, and being like, oh, that's great, you know, that's great. Oh, that's really funny. No, that's terrible. I look horrible there. You know, I, I have one request, make me look pretty, you know? And, um, and so she, so a lot of the things that, um, so she didn't have a say in, in, you know, in the editing process, but she did see, um, because she, she was no longer, she had forgotten that we were making the movie. And, um, and I can talk about when we decided to end that collaboration also, because I think that's a, a really important part of the story. But she did see um, cuts of the film and she did have, and I, she gave me notes, you know, she saw 20 minute versions, she never saw the full length, but she gave me notes and she would be like, I, I don't want any more people talking about me, I want more me, you know, <laughs> so that was a big note. And I was really worried about the memory sections and she said, oh, you know, it says that I lost my memory, but I never had one to begin with. It was always terrible, you know, and she was laughing and, um, and, but most of all, she just sat there with a huge smile on her face, taking it in. But my, I mean, go, you know, beginning the, the process, I just thought we were going to take it to the end together. I thought we were going to edit and sit together in an editing room with an editor and, and so that was really sad for me to go forward without her. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, it would have become a different film, probably, um, but I hope not too different. I hope that, you know, that, that Irene's vision, you know, came through in our edit. Right. And so that also kind of leads me to wonder, um, in terms of the creative process, did you see benefits of working on this project for Irene that extended to other areas of her life or other areas of her function? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, our working on this project also brought in all of these people. Um, I went out and I interviewed uh, friends of Irene's, her family. It brought her family back into her life in ways that like that, that, you know, I mean, they were already involved. Some of them were already involved, but it brought others in. Um, it galvanized, you know, the community as much as we could to, tr you know, around, you um, around care and also creative care for Irene. So I think that like the project had had ripples and then it just continued to ripple out. I, and I think that um, after it was done, which Irene unfortunately didn't you know, get to experience directly because she by that time she was at Amsterdam Nursing Home and she was not able to come to the screening that we had at, at, at MoMA or you know, our, our premiere and um, not able to really, uh, take in what happened to um, after the film came out, which was that her, you know, that her, she became more seen and more visible and, and, and her, her career, uh, which had, you know, um, not been, not been forgotten, but I think people had, you know, um, it had definitely had a resurgence that I think she didn't get to experience because, um, because of where she was at. So, so I think it, it, it did a lot of things. It, it was, um, it was such a tool, you know, I mean, it was such a, um, ther it was, uh, it was art therapy that we were doing, you know, in a lot of ways uh, for both of us. And then it was also this tool to like invite people back into her life that, that, that would have otherwise not re-entered. So I think it did a lot. It sounds like it definitely did a lot. That's it's incredible how the project was able to kind of just bring so many loose ends back together and and weave something really beautiful. So Michelle, traditionally, the symptoms of dementia they're depicted in the media and at diagnosis as a tragedy narrative. What was your experience with Irene? That's a great question, Nettie. Thanks for asking it. Um, my experience was entirely the opposite. Um, which was why it was so important to tell this story because I, over the years, I'd seen so many films that, um, that were so devoid of hope or, you know, uh, joy of, um, really, you know, really, um, treating that really treated, uh, the subject or, you know, the person who was going through dementia as a victim, uh, as no longer there, as no longer a person. And you know, in the in the uh, early stages of editing, I read this fantastic book by Thomas Kitwood, which was called Dementia Reconsidered, and it 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 basically um, 
was about dementia center, you know, the, the care of the person. And so it's not um, person, you know, with person lowercase with dementia, capital D, it's person, capital P, with dementia, lowercase d, you know, and that was the approach that we took um, in, in the editing. And, and it was, you know, it's like this forgotten period of time, like someone there, and I also did this research about, um, you know, writers who'd had dementia and what happened to them. And there was a, a, an Irish writer who uh, was very outspoken about his dementia. And it, it went from like, you know, all of these news clippings to him going into a home and then the next news clipping being his obituary. So you hear that somebody has Alzheimer's or dementia and then the next news, like Gar Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you hear that, that he's got Alzheimer's and then the next news piece is his death. And like for me, there's a whole span of living that goes in between that. And there was this whole time that I spent with Irene that was exhilarating and intoxicating and like, you know, and life being lived with dementia, you know, and, and, and not even, and not even focusing on the dementia, just life being lived. And I feel like that's what we need to, to, we need to, you know, um, change the narrative, but also, um, populate it with, with people like Irene, who are going to remind us that, um, that the present moment is all that we have, you know, and that, and that is, you know, and being, being grateful for that. And, and Michelle, we're actually grateful because you are doing your part with Irene on changing that narrative with this film. So we are so hopeful that all the viewers that are watching us today they're going to watch your film and we're going to share that information at the end on how they can watch your film. So thank you for being a change maker. Oh, thank you so much for watching the film and for having me here. Absolutely. So we have just a couple more questions if you have time for us, Michelle, would that be okay? Of course, I'm having a, I'm having a ball. Go ahead. So you mentioned that your experience of cognitive change is that the person is still there throughout and that they're still life to be lived. With Irene, how did you see her maintaining her identity throughout the stages of, of her dementia and perhaps even into, you, you touched upon the later stages. What, what, what parts of her were still coming through? How did you know she was still there? She was still Irene? Oh, I think, you know, in the early stages, I mean, which is where, you know, I mean, I would say, I don't know where our film falls. I would say early to mid stage. Um, and, you know, that, that collaboration, um, the end of that collaboration wasn't the end of our friendship. I mean, I, I, we continued to stay very close until, you know, I was there the day she died. You know, I mean, that was, um, so, so I did get to see all of the different stages as she went through them. And, um, and I would say, you know, her love of um, music and her sense of humor and um, and uh, and tactile, the need for tactile touch, um, the need for connection. Um, but I would say her sense of humor uh, stayed, you know, with her for a very long time. Um, and uh, and definitely, you know, in in the um, early stages, I mean, you see it in the film. I mean, she's incredibly quick-witted, you know? I mean, she is, she's on her toes and she can turn, uh, you know, a, a moment that is potentially earth shattering into um, a bit of, you know, she flips it into a humorous, she adds her humorous take on it. And I think that, you know, um, people were afraid to go visit her in the nursing home because they didn't know what they were going to find and, and they they came away being like oh my god I just had the most incredible experience just sitting with Irene and her you know and 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 just having you know this tactile touch moment with her um and it and you know she's never never one to be uh there are emotional moments in the film but she's not angry she wasn't, you know, and, and I think that in her, in her life before um, 
before the you know the the dementia she um she could be harsh she could be critical she was you know she was not the easiest person to work with on all of her projects um but she she was she had that sense of joy and i think that sense of joy carried her through all the way till the end i'd say um you know i mean not not every day you know i mean you had like there are definitely um days when she, you know she didn't, you know, wake up, you know, she basically spent the day in bed or, or was just like non-responsive when you went to go visit her or, you know, but, but the, it, I, I, I mean, we all have those days, you know, so, so what, um, yeah, so what the, so the takeaway for me is that actually, um, you know, the, per, the person is always there. We're just going through changes as we go through our lives, you know, and we change in every moment. So, um, uh, you know, it would infuriate me when people would say she's no longer there. You know, even in the late, late, late stages, it would still infuriate me. And I would be like, what are you talking about? And stop talking about her in the third person, or, you know, or in the past tense. Um, and so, you know, that that really fueled me when I was editing and 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 really um and and really still fuels me today about the work that I want to do in the dementia community because I just feel like the stigma is so great. And the need is so great to change the narrative. Yeah. And, and you are, as Nettie said, you are making a real impact and this film is making a real impact. So we're excited for our viewers to, to be able to see it. Absolutely. Um, you've shared a little bit, but we want to give you another opportunity. Um, what do you hope people gain from viewing your film? Oh, well, I, I mean, one of the missions, there's so many different missions of this film, but like one of them is that, you know, they'll come away being like, who is this playwright? I need to read all of her, all of her plays and, and know about her, you know, I mean, that's, you know, with the theater community that that was a big, a big um, wish of ours, you know, and um, but for for the, the community of caregivers and the community that were, you know, of in the, in, in the, the outreach to um, different organizations that deal with cognitive care. Um, I want them to come away with, with um, there's another way to enter in to people's lives. Um, and maybe it is with a camera and maybe it is with through, you know, through doing writing exercises. And maybe it is with like taking, you know, taking trips with people, you know, and I think, um, I think, you know, I want people to come away with, there's a different way to approach this illness and there's, a, and there's a creative way to do it. And, um, and that to not be afraid of entering into that relationship. Yeah, I think, I think that comes through really, really strong in, in what you're doing. And, and it's, it's pretty amazing to see. So Michelle, when you look back, not only on your work with Irene, but on her life as you know it, how do you interpret her legacy? What do you feel she's kind of left to this world? Oh, I think she's left so much, but I think the thing that will stay with me and that I hope stays with people after they watch the film is how do you lead a creative life? How do you live a creative life? How do you live a life fully um, doing what you love? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and how do you, um, when one form fails you, how do you find another? Um, you know, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, that's where I came in with Irene, but I think that, um, you know, that's what her work was always doing. It was, it was always, um, it wasn't about a template that you fit the play into. It was about the, the play dictating to you what it wanted to be. And I think that that's how life should be lived. You know, that your, you know, your life tells you what you should be doing. It's not the other way around. Um, and so I hope that that's, that's, that's part of her legacy, uh, you know, that you, that you get from watching the film. It definitely comes through. <laughs> Absolutely. Michelle, Kelly and I want to thank you for being with us today and taking the time to answer so many of our questions. And we also want to thank you for collaborating with us here at Inspired Memory Care because you have been gracious enough to share your documentary and we're going to have a viewing in November. And we are going to put that information in the comments right now where any viewer is welcome to join us in November and watch with us. And the date I believe is November, what's the date? 
November 17th. November 17th. So it's right here in the comment section. So you can see that. And there's also, if you click on it, there's a flyer there where you can click to register and join us all on November 17th in the evening to watch the documentary, The Rest I Make Up. And thank you so much again, Michelle. And I'm so glad that you shared a bit of your friendship with Irene with us here and the viewers today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you for joining today's discussion. We hope you will join us on Tuesday, November 17th, as mentioned previously, for a screening of the documentary, The Rest I Make Up. Participants are invited to join filmmaker Michelle Memran, Diana Blackwelder, and Brian Van Buren of Dementia Minds and Dr. Ann Basting. Together, they will lead an interactive discussion about the impact of the creative arts on the biopsychosocial realms and living well with dementia. If you would like to connect with us, please feel free to visit our website at www.inspiredmemorycare.com or feel free to email us at info, I-N-F-O, at inspiredmemorycare.com. And once again, we would like to thank the 80th Street residents for hosting our training, education, and resource center. Please feel free to join them on their website at 80thstreetresidents.com and take a virtual tour and see what events they have coming up. Next week, we hope you will join us as we have another guest speaker, Jackie Pinkowitz from Dementia Action Alliance, powered by people with purpose. And so please, same time, same place. See you next week and stay inspired.